All right, where we are, you remember we, we studied, the, looked at the first nine chapters of Proverbs, and then chapters 10 to 31, uh, you have some lengthy discourses like the, the woman of Proverbs in 31, but there you have a lot of the classic Proverbs, you know, what we typically think of as Proverbs. So in the first nine chapters, you had some Proverbs like that, some instruction, but really what you had was focused there in the first nine chapters was this call to choose, to decide that you're going to pursue wisdom. And then in 10 through 31, you get these collections of Proverbs. And what I've done, I'm organizing them in a way, this is, as I tell, this is just how my mind works. I, I see things and I say, okay, these things work like this. Now, on some of the organization, you can say, well, this would better go here or there. I get that. But I'm trying to give you a way that I think will help you. I'm, I'm pulling out of these Proverbs what I call the sketch of a wise person. And so the first category I have are just some general attitudes and characteristics. He's submissive to the will of God, and then I have three subcategories. And it fears the Lord, trusts in the Lord rather than his own understanding, and then shuns evil and does what is righteous. And so under that, I've tried to give you a, a number of subcategories, like hypocritical worship is unacceptable. I put that there because that shows that if you're not living righteously, and then you come and, and worship God, he hates it. Because righteous living is the context of meaningful worship. That's how, that's how it is. It flows out of a life that is surrendered to God. If your life is not surrendered to God, you live like he's not God all during the week, and then you come and worship him. He says, as he said with Israel, that's an abomination to me. So that's why I put that there. They have avoids illicit sexual relations, does not get drunk, does not steal or defraud, and then is not lazy, and there were a lot on that. Now, Honor uh, said to me afterwards, and I thought it was a good point, I said if I'd have thought of it, I'd have said it. When you see all of these things about you need to be diligent, you need to work hard, it is easy to slip into the sense that by working hard and by not being lazy, that it is by your own hand that these things have happened. And see, so that's a difficult thing to understand, that you are called to work hard and be diligent, but in that you always must understand that all that you have is given to you by God. And it's the same thing he said to the Israelites. He says, you're going to go into the land, and everything, good times are going to roll, you're going to have all kinds of stuff, and you will then wind up saying, it is by my hand that I have these things. And don't ever do that. So that's a, that's a thing you have to watch. So shuns evil and does what is righteous, is not lazy, and then right when we ended, I was looking at does not lie. And here are the texts that I have there. 1217, whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, but a false witness utters deceit. 1219, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. 1222, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. 13.5, the righteous hates falsehood. But the wicked brings shame and disgrace. 14.5, a faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. 14.25, a truthful witness saves lives, but one who breathes out lies is deceitful. 19.5, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will not escape. 19.9, a false witness will not go unpunished, he who breathes out lies will perish. 19.28, a worthless witness mocks at justice, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. 21.6, the getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a snare of death. People deceive people. They get things from them by lying to them, defrauding them, this kind of thing. So you see that a, a wise person, a person who is skilled at living in God's world, does not lie. Because lying doesn't produce good fruit. It alienates people, it gets them chapped at you, it gets you in trouble. So when you're instructing somebody, a child, for example, how do you, who teaches their child to lie? Nobody does. Why? Because you want to bless your child's life. You don't tell your kid when you're in a tight, go ahead and tell a lie. Okay, well, that's what, that's what the wise man is saying. This is how you're to live to navigate successfully in the Lord's world. 2128, a false witness will perish with the word of the of a man who hears will endure. 24, 28, be not a witness against your neighbor without cause and do not deceive with your lips. 25, 18, a man who bears false witness against his neighbors like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. 
not good things. 37 to 8, two things I ask of you, deny them not before, to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. And then I say you can see also 6, 16 to 19 that we looked at before, which reinforces the same idea. So in the sketch of the wise person, wise person does not lie. Shuns evil, does what is righteous, uh, does not lie in addition to these other things is not greedy, is not grasping, is not somebody who's materialistic and lives for what he can accumulate. This is not a way to be. If you're driven by that kind of thing, it will not turn out well for you in this life. And so here you see, whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. The guy who's greedy, he wants a bribe. Why? I don't care how I get it. I want money. I want money. You want to give me money? Sure, I'll do anything for money. Why? That, that's what animates me. And that's not a way to be. He says a greedy man stirs up strife because he's into everything trying to get stuff. But the one who trusts in the Lord will be enriched. And 119, we previously looked at that. You see that. Another one. Is not greedy. So a wise person living in this world, somebody who lives skillfully in God's created order, is not greedy, does not quarrel, okay, you, everybody knows people like this, okay, does not quarrel. The beginning of strife is like letting out water. What's he mean by that? Well, it's not easy to control, you see, and, and you can't stop it. So when you start these, you know, how they, you know how things like this, they just explode, you start, you've seen this. This is basically when you talk about road rage or any of this other stuff. What happens? They just, and so he says, the beginning of strife is like letting out water, so quit before the quarrel breaks out. How does a wise person live? This is the way a wise person lives. And I have to say, my, uh, my son-in-law, I haven't told him this yet, but my daughter told me the story. They were at a, a drive through just recently, and, and, you know, to leave room for the person behind you so they can make their order, he gets up close to the guy in front of him so the person behind him can get up there. Well, this guy in front of him starts making obscene gestures. <laughs> He's got his whole family in the car. You know, his three kids and all this, and this guy's just going off and hanging out the car, and, you know, you can guess the gestures. <laughs> and so Matt, to his credit, just, you know, didn't, uh, you know, react to that. But you can see how from that somebody could jump out and say, you know, dude, what are you doing? All right, well, then what happens? You see, all right, so, that's, so this is the thing. All right, it is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. It's an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife. Who can sit here and just say, listen, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get down and wallow in the mud like that. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire. So is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. He just throws on the fuel. This is what a quarrelsome person does. Do not be that way. If you want to live skillfully in this world, don't be that kind of person. And that's what the wise man is saying. Now, so I'm, I'm moving now. Okay, some general attitudes and characteristics. He's submissive to the will of God. These three subcategories. Under the third, we had a, quite a few sub-subcategories. Now, he is humble not proud. This is a wise person. This is how a person is to be in this world. When 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. By pride, this idea of, you know, like I'm the cat's pajamas. I'm the greatest thing going. I know everything. I'm, I'm just it. Nobody can tell me anything. I'm better than you. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. And so it just is a course of problems for your life if you have this perception of yourself, you see. So he says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. 1525, the Lord tears down the house of the proud, but maintains the widow's boundaries. 1533, the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Listen to what the wise man is saying about the character, how you are to be. 16.5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. So this, this sense of arrogance, pride, thinking you're the greatest thing going, nobody can tell you anything, uh, you're more important than everybody else. This is not going to lead to a good life. 
It's going to be a tragedy, in fact. <clears throat> 16, 18, and 19. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of lowly spirit with the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. You see, the, the way to be is this idea of, of a, an accurate assessment of yourself and recognizing that you're not the smartest, the greatest, the grandest. That you're not due deference from everybody you run into. They ought to bow down just for the glory of being in your presence. That's not how you be. Haughty eyes, uh, 21, for haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked are sin. 21, 24, scoffer is the name of the arrogant. Haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. Yes, just dismissive of everything. And we'll see in a second. Nobody can tell him anything. Uh, 22 4 the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life the reward for humility 25 6 and 7 do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great for it's better to be told come up here than to put than to be put lower in the presence of a noble sounds like something Jesus said right you see I mean you, you don't want to come up here and say I'm here you're fortunate to have me so I will take the seat at the head of the table and then somebody comes in and says uh, excuse me, who are you? What's your name again? No, no, no. You're back there. So this is uh, 20, 25, 27. It is not good to eat much honey, nor is it, glor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. You see, it's good to, to, to be diligent and to pursue good works and good things, but not this sense that I want to be glorified in it. 26, 12. Do you see a man who's wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. So you think, he, he thinks, look, I've hung, I hung the moon. 29, 23. One's pride will bring him low, but he who's lowly in spirit will obtain honor. This is how we are to be. So we have this idea of he is humble, not proud, and as a subcategory of being humble, confesses his sin. One of the reasons we won't confess sin is because we don't want people to think we're not the greatest thing ever. We don't want people to think, oh, this person sinned. Well, of course this person sinned. He's a fallen human being. So, you know, you, it's not a secret to anybody, but it's this sense of pride that keeps us from being willing to confess sin. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. You see, that's the way to mercy. Confess the sin. Be honest about your life. Don't try to fool yourself. Don't try to hide it and conceal. Just when, you're, when you do wrong, acknowledge it. And I got to tell you, within marriages, wouldn't that help? You see, you do wrong, you say, yes, I, I did this, I was wrong to do this. I'm sorry. But pride doesn't want to admit wrongdoing. And so this is what the, the wise man is saying. That is not the way to be. That is not the way to be. It won't, go, it won't go well for you. He's humble, not proud. Submits to the Lord's discipline. You saw with Israel a lot of times, like in the book of Amos you can see this, where the Lord is disciplining the people of Israel. He's withholding rain. He's doing this and all that. For trying to get their attention trying to get them to recognize that they are in sin so they wonder and say, okay, why is this happening to me? The Lord is disciplining me to get my attention so I will repent of sin. That doesn't mean every time something bad happens to you that it is discipline. Things can happen to you when it is not the Lord disciplining you and trying to get your attention for sin. You see that in the book of Job. But the Lord can be trying to get your attention for sin. So here it says, submits to the Lord's discipline. When the Lord disciplines us, will we hear it and respond to it? Or will it be like this? Crush a fool in a mortar with a pestle along with crushed grain, yet his folly will not depart from him. He will not accept or receive the discipline of the Lord and, uh, and convert it into the benefit for which the Lord intended it. He simply won't do that. And you see chapter 3, verse 11 and 12 that we talked about before. So here we have, he's humble, not proud, <clears throat> confesses his sin, submits to the Lord's discipline, and is teachable. See, what goes along with this idea that I'm, I'm the greatest thing? Know all, see all, am all. 
Nobody can tell me squat. Well, you then miss out on the benefit of people being able to teach you. If you will not be humble and let somebody teach you something, who are you to teach me? I already know everything. See, that's a wall. Who suffers from that? The guy trying to teach you doesn't suffer. You do. Because you're missing the benefit of the teaching that otherwise would bless your life. And why are you doing this? Because you're just prideful. You're, you're proud instead of humble. The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. That's 10.8. 1017, whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. So when somebody tries to correct you, you can't correct me. I'm not going to accept it. I don't care how strong the case. I don't care how clear it is. I'm not going to accept it because my pride will not allow that to come in. 12.1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. He's stupid. Why? Because he's rejecting the thing that will bless him. In 13.1, uh, a wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Scoffer says, I don't care. You're, just trying, to, you're trying to bless him. You're trying to help him, trying to correct him. I'm not listening. Uh, 13.18, poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. That's 15.5. 15.12, a scoffer does not like to be reproved. He will not go to the wise. So he's going to go to people who will reinforce the error he's already in, who will tell him what he's doing is okay, instead of going to somebody who really has wisdom, who would challenge what he's doing. You see, who would challenge what he's doing. 15, 31, 32, the ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. Whoever ignores instruction despises himself, but he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. 17.10, a rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. You see, as somebody who's sensitive, I'm not talking about paranoid. I'm talking about somebody who's sensitive and open to wisdom and correct reproof. So when you, you then receive it, then you're blessed by it. So this is what he means. It goes deeper into a man of understanding, somebody who's equipped to benefit from it, than a hundred blows to a fool. The person absorbs it and is benefited by it. 1815, an intelligent heart acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. 1920, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. 1925, strike a scoffer and the simple will learn prudence. Reprove a man of understanding and he will gain knowledge. You reprove him. Just tell him and he will gain knowledge. 1927, Cease to hear instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. You shut down, you stop hearing, you stop learning because of your pride, and you will, uh, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. 25.12, like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. You see, it, it, he's not mean. This is a thing that in our culture we've got to get rid of. He's not mean. To tell somebody something they need to hear. That is what it means to love people. A person who will let somebody suffer because they don't want them to think they're legalistic and trying to correct them does not love that person. You see, that is cowardly. And that is not how we're to be. That doesn't mean we come down on people with uh, undue harshness or any of that kind of thing. You understand that. It means that we're trying to bless them. If they are wise, they will benefit from it. If they're not, they'll suffer like the fool does here. A 29.1, he who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. So here, the person who rejects these attempts to bless him and benefit him keeps stiffening his neck, rejecting, rejecting. He's headed for a fall, headed for a fall. And you can see the same in 8.33.4.979 that we talked about before. All right, so here it is, humble, not proud, confesses his sins, submits to the Lord's discipline, is teachable, and is open to advice, which is very similar. You see, very similar. It will receive people's advice. The person who's proud thinks he knows everything, so what can you tell him? Why am I going to listen to you? 
Right? I mean, come on. I know more than you, better than you. So pff, what do you have to tell me? And I think, the, I think these things are huge problems. It's open to advice. 12, uh, 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Okay, the person says, no, 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 I, I have it figured out. This, yet people are telling him that's not going to help you. Parents, just think of your kids. Just think of your kids and times you've tried to tell them. And say, listen, this is, I, I'm trying to help you. Okay? Well, you, I think we can relate to that, but it's not limited to kids, obviously. 1310. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Now, does that mean that every time somebody says something to you, you're bound to follow it? No. Taking advice means weighing it seriously. You see, it means not blowing it off. Not automatically saying, I'm not going to listen to that because I already know everything. It is weighing it seriously. And if it's wise counsel, then absorbing it and acting on it. Okay, so you have a responsibility in that regard. Uh, 1522, with counsel, uh, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. 1920, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. 27, 5, and 6, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Now listen to this. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Now, that's what I talk about. See, when I talk about churches and discipline and disfellowship, everybody, you can't do that. Do you know how that will make us appear? I don't care. <laughs> what I want to be is a blessing to people. You see, this isn't some kind of show. You want to benefit people. And if people get to the point that the way to benefit them is they have to be disfellowshipped, it is not being mean, it is to bless them. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're going to keep kissing them. That, no, that's okay. Every, you know that's fine. And what does that do for the person? The person then is cut off. You see? So this idea, better open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That's the person who loves you, who will come in and say, gently, delicately, all of that, but who will come in and say to you, hey, you really can't be doing this. This is really not right to be doing this. You're mistreating this person here. Okay? That's what this is about. Uh, so we have, is humble, not proud. And then, so, these are general attitudes and characteristics. Submissive to the will of God, humble, not proud. The next one I have, he is self-controlled. This is a sketch of a wise person, one who's skilled at living in God's created world. He's self-controlled. 1727. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. He's not a hothead. He's not somebody who flies off. He's somebody who can restrain himself and be reflective. Will that benefit you in this world? Any of you who've you know, lived any length of time know that. It will be a blessing to you. 25, 28, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. He's just gone crazy. You see, he's just lost all control. And, you know, this, this is important. Uh, and you, you see this. He's self-controlled, especially with regard to anger. Now, this is, now, I'm preaching to me here. I'm preaching here. See, this is to me. Because I know how, I know how tough this is. Anger like this is not helpful to anybody. All right, a man of quick temper, 1417, acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. A man of quick temper acts foolishly, explodes, and does things, as I've said before, if they were on videotape and they were played before this group, would be humiliating. Why? Okay, because it makes you crazy. And you do things that are absurd and do things that are wrong and harmful and all that kind of stuff. 1429, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. 1518, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. See, breathe deep. Just, just breathe deep and be calm. Instead of going in, you see, and yeah, yeah. This, this leads to difficulties and problems in life. 1632, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. 
and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. This idea of controlling anger, and this is something that is a mark of righteousness. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. You see, that's again, that's what I was thinking about with my son-in-law. In fact, I thought about sending that to him. To, to, instead of just jumping out and saying, how dare you, just saying, okay, you know, this is, this is trivial. And I'm not going to go out here and jump out and lose my mind in front of my children, uh, you know, like an unwise person, like a fool would do, and get into some kind of fight in a parking lot with this guy. All right, so that's um, 2911. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. So in instruction on skillful living, you see, this is something, that, this idea of being, being uh, self-controlled, especially with regard to anger. I just say that that's something that is difficult. We have to work on it. We talked about Wednesday night. I don't know if Terry, I think Terry doesn't see it the way I do. But my judgment is there is an anger that is righteous. Okay? I, I get to that because Jesus was sinless and Jesus was angry. So there is an anger that is not sinful. And I believe there is a righteous anger, and I can point that out to people and say there are times when you can recognize it is not noble to yawn at wrongdoing. You see, there are evils that if you are blasé about them, that's not to your credit. There are things that should ignite in you a righteous indignation as they do in God. And see, and sometimes so, in a, on Wednesday we're talking about, and I use the example of the civil rights movement, you see. But self-control, we're not talking about that anger. As I said then, too, that anger is far, far too rare. That we really get righteously indignant about sins and wrongs and things like that. The anger we're talking about is anger that you've done something to me. How dare you do something to me? Okay, that's the anger, and that is the anger that leads to a life of difficulty. It will lead to you breaking up marriages, losing your job, on and on, people not wanting to be around you. It's just a bummer. And so the wise man's giving instruction, listen to me. Woman wisdom or woman folly, what's it going to be? You're going to follow wisdom or you're going to follow folly? And so follow wisdom and your life will be blessed because of it. Sketch of a wise person, he is forgiving, not vindictive. You know, these things don't just occur in the New Testament. You know, sometimes we look at the Old Testament like, oh, the Old Testament, well, you know, that's just all these, you know, just nasty, mean rules. I'm thinking, who do you think made those rules? Those rules came from God, right? But, but no, so we've got these things. No, look, he's forgiving, not vindictive. This is how a person is to be. 1911, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is to his glory to overlook an offense. Uh, use that one in another place. 2022, uh, do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will deliver you. Is that, is that Paul? Is that the Apostle Paul I'm hearing? Uh, uh, 2429, do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will, repay, I will pay the man back for what he's done. Okay, don't be that way. I know how tempting it is. Somebody's done something to you. Uh, you want to come back, and you want to come back harder. Was, I'll teach you. Fool, mess with me. But see, that's not the road to, for right living. That doesn't create the kind of life that is a blessing. That kind of attitude will come back and bite you. Not to mention it's just contrary to how God would have you live. 24, 29, do not say, I will do to him as he's done to me. I will pay the man back for what he's done. 25, 21, 22, if your enemy's hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Paul again, for you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. So how, how, what is a wise person? What is the picture of a wise person that is painted in Proverbs? Well, part of it is this idea. He or she's forgiving, not vindictive. Let stuff roll off. Doesn't insist on paybacks. Now, I know you hear that, but will you walk with woman wisdom, meaning will you internalize that and have that be part of your life so that that is indeed how you live? It will be a benefit to you. He plans wisely for the future. He just doesn't bop along and just do whatever, let things fall. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who's hasty comes only to poverty. So the person is somebody who will plan, who will understand. If the Lord gives me another day, 
I, then I sit here and I say, okay, I want to plan. I want to make plans about the future. That's not wrong. And so, it's, in fact, it's a mark of wisdom to do that. So that's one of the things. He plans wisely for the future. And this involves seeking advice from wise people. This ties in with the idea of being humble, not proud. But in planning, it involves seeking advice from wise people. Plans are established by counsel, by wise guidance, wage war. So it's when you're, you're embarked on something, you have something you're, you're doing, some enterprise you're engaging in. Well, plans are established by counsel. I mean, you don't have to be the only one to think of things. You know, when I think of our world, in fact, you and I live at a time where we have access to wisdom from all over the place. You see, this is kind of why, you know, there are times I, I think that, how do I want to say this? I learn a lot from biblical scholars and commentators. I think there's sometimes, in some people, there's a reluctance to engage them because they're not the Bible, okay? I understand they're not the Bible. They are not the Bible, and they are not inspired, and they can be wrong. But they are like counselors, you see, to me. And so as you, as you study and think of people who've spent many, many years thinking about things, so many times they provide an angle and an insight that if I had to go and learn what it took them to learn to develop that insight, I'd be dead. So I can go and pull on these things. And I see it kind of like plans are established by, by counsel, by wise guidance, wage war. 24, 5, and 6. A wise man is full of strength, and a man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance, you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Now, whether you want to you know, say, well, I don't plan on waging war, I understand that. But the principle is that in facing things in the future, that you are making plans, it is wise to plan, and in planning, it is wise to seek wise counselors. People you trust, you know, this isn't something you just go point in the phone book, but people you think, okay, I think these guys, you know, th th here are people who know me, I trust them, uh, I think they can deal with confidences and all of that, but you then you get their reading on things. And what do you think and how do you think they would, they would look at this? That will benefit you. So he plans wisely for the future. It involves seeking advice from wise people. And it includes awareness and acceptance of the fact God's plans may override. Who doesn't know this? John and I, the line, this really comes from John, but his line's always, this life isn't turning out like I planned. <laughs> you see? So, I mean, John had ideas and, you know, things that he was intending and his vision of things. Uh, I think John would still be a missionary in China, Taiwan. Uh, but life didn't work out that way for him. And so that's what he means. So, see, God will override our plans. And you see that. So it includes an awareness of that fact. As we plan, as we do so through wise counselors, we do everything with an understanding that God may say, I have something else in mind. I have something else in mind. You can see this here. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his step. 16.9. 1921, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So you may have plans. You may have this idea, I'm going to go here, do this, do this, do this, and something may happen, you see, the, to divert those plans. 27.1, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Now, isn't that the truth? You see, you, you, you don't know. You and I sit here, in fact, I, I just... Uh, I had a, a routine checkup with a cardiologist, said everything's great. And so I was telling my brothers in a text, I said, now I hope I don't drop dead tonight. <laughs> you, you know, you, this, is how, this is how life is. And I, sometimes I think people think, well, you're morose. I said, no, I just understand. I had a brother die at age 39, out of the blue. No clue, just dropped dead, had a ruptured aneurysm. All right. So that's how life is. I don't know, you know, I, I pray, I pray that the Lord will give me strength to, to carry on, that I can do other things, but I know that my life's in his hand. So, so this idea, see, it, plans are committed to God in that sense. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. I think what he's talking about is that in your making of plans, you commit them to him, you plan with the understanding and the acceptance of the fact that he may override your plans. 
See, that is the backdrop of everything you do. I have plans, I have ideas, I have thoughts, I've counseled, this is what we're going to do. That's part of living wisely in this world, but I do know, Lord, that you override. And so I think that's part of what, the, or what he's talking about. Okay, he plans wisely for the future. He is reliable. Sketch of a wise person. You want to live successfully in this world? Uh, do you want to live in this world in a way that's skillful? Uh, woman wisdom says, you know, this is how to live skillfully in this world. Listen to me. Heed my words. Well, a wise person is reliable. You see here in 1026, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who send him. If you are that kind of person, if you are somebody that nobody can count on, when I call on you to do something, when I send you to do something, I give you a project or count on you for anything, and you don't do it. How do you think that will play in your life? Do you think that'll be a, you know, that'll be a resume enhancer? <laughs> Hi, when people call on me to do something, I never do it. <laughs> no. So what will happen? People will avoid you. People won't use you. You see, and that's what this is. Like vinegar to the smoke to the eyes. It's like, man. <laughs> you know when smoke gets in your eyes, it's like, what a bummer. Well, that's what this is like. So is the slugger to those who send him. 2513, like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. See, a faithful messenger, you say, well, I'm not planning to be delivering any messages. I understand. But you take the idea, you see, what it means by a faithful messenger is somebody who faithfully discharges uh, the, the task they were given. So that when you give it to them, you can count on them. They will get it done. They will get it done right. And see, that's a blessing. So what happens? Then you get a reputation. You're at work. You're that kind of person. What happens? You rise. You get raises. You get promotions. Uh, your life is financially better off. You're another person who doesn't do that. What happens? You go from job to job to job. Why? Because you can't be relied on. And so, you know, like you try to tell that to young people. So what? I don't care. <laughs> You know, that's how you're going to walk with woman wisdom or woman folly. That's the whole point. The idea is to bless your life. Some general attitudes and characteristics. Now, here is is person's relationship with his family. Okay, so now I'm into the second large category. First one here, general attitudes and characteristics. Now, a sketch of a wise person in relationship with his family. His relationship to his parents respects them. Now, i got to say that we live in a culture that, and I think it's for marketing reasons, I think that we try to isolate generations, label them so we can sell them things, and tell them that you're like no other group of people. You know, there, there's never been, a, never been, you're spe you are, let's use the term, millennials. Oh, oh, okay, you're a millennial. I said, okay, millennials. Did you know that millennials care about authenticity? I said, no. All during my life, I grew up thinking phonies were fine. <laughs> Everybody I knew thought a phony was okay and a hypocrite was cool. Yeah. No, but they care about authenticity. All right, don't get me off on it. But, <laughs> but I said, okay, so what we have here, you, you, I think that's what it is. But what I'm saying is we, we have, whether it's for marketing reasons or not, we have generations that are really taught subtly to disrespect the prior generation. To disrespect. Now, the way I read the book is there's wisdom with age. You see, it is not that everybody kowtows because somebody knows how to operate Facebook. Well, they, they, they then know the end of the world. They know everything because they know how to use devices and gadgets. Well, they then really have true wisdom, and you're just somebody who's not worth anything. Okay, that's a subtext I pick up in our culture. Now, maybe you don't, you don't see that, but that's me. Okay, and so this idea, see, a wise person respects their parents. Grandchildren are the crown of the age, and the glory of children is their father's. 1926, he who does violence to his father and chases away his mother is a son who brings shame and reproach. 2020, if one curses his father and his mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. This idea that I can, you know, that my parents are know-nothing drags who, uh, besides giving me birth, have supported me my entire life. But they, they are no-nothing drags 
who aren't due respect and don't know anything is not right. And you lose the benefit. Well, is that just because you want as an older person to have people? No. Although I like that. <laughs> what it is is that who loses from this? You lose from this. If you don't think that your parents have any wisdom to convey to you, you will not benefit from it. You know, they didn't just appear yesterday. They weren't always this old. They have lived a life. They have gone through things you're going... Nobody said, no, that was back in, way back then. Look, people are people. Do you see? They've gone, through, they've gone through things, and they have wisdom to impart to you. And if you disrespect them and will not learn from them, well, then you're going to be the one who suffers for that. You're going to be the one who suffers. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she's old. That's 23, 22. 30, 17, the eye that mocks a father and, and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. Doesn't sound good, does it? Okay, what is this about? It's this idea that you are to view your parents respectfully so you will benefit from them and you will be a blessing to them. Respects parents, listens to parents. I know this is like, you know, this, this is heresy to, you know, don't listen to parents. All they're trying to do, parents are just trying to bum you out, crowd your space, uh, you know, mess with you and not give you this and that. Parents, I'm talking about healthy parents. I understand that there are parents in this world that, that are crazy. You know, by that I mean parents who, are, who you know, don't share what I think is a God-given love for children. I'm talking about regular, normal parents. Normal parents would die for their children. Okay? They would die for their children. That's kind of a foundational thing. A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. 15.5, a fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. 23.22, listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she's old. Listen to them. They've got, they, they can bless you. They can benefit you. I don't care what television is telling you. I don't care that television is telling you your parents are morons. Every parent. I know every father on television is a moron. What's he know? He's a, oh, he comes in bumbling around. Oh, I don't know anything. I'm just a stupid man. Okay? Well, you think that's by accident? Do you think that's just, you know, that's just friendly TV? Or do you think that there is a force behind that? A being behind that that is trying to disrupt divine wisdom? I'm in that category. I see the enemy's work and all that kind of stuff. But I did hear that bell, so I'm through. Thanks for coming. <laughs>